A symptom of the depressed mind is a tendency towards what is called catastrophization. To catastrophize, to make a small issue something gigantic and even life-threatening or um, extremely dangerous. Um, I think that uh, not only depressed people uh, suffer from this tendency, but in depressed people it's um, markedly present. It's something that dominates their thinking. I mentioned before that just a minor little thing like a, a, dish full, a sink full of dirty dishes can seem like some insurmountable obstacle. The depressed person might pick up the newspaper and see uh, some disaster on the other side of the planet and feel as though they're right in the middle of it. Um, a lot of people who recall their reaction uh, on 9-11, uh, this is 12 years ago now almost, uh, might feel a little bit uh, uh, of a flashback when I mention that. I certainly felt like I might as well have been at ground zero watching the towers come down. That's catastrophizing. Um, seeing things that might, e might actually be terrible if you're there, but in the grand scheme of things aren't that big of a deal, or seeing things like a sink full of dirty dishes for what they are not, i.e. some horrible, insurmountable obstacle. Um, I think that this tendency to catastrophize makes people easy to manipulate, uh, depressed people. Um, I've often formed the opinion that depressed people, sort of, when it comes to being manipulated, fall into two camps. They're either impossible to manipulate, i.e., their depression has made them indifferent to everything, so they simply don't care, so you can stand there and harangue them all you want, and they, you get no reaction except for, yeah, well, uh... Or, um, their natural tendency to, towards anxiety and fear makes them easy to manipulate. A lot of religious revivalists rely on that technique uh, to get people who, are, who have anxieties to convert in order to be saved. It's uh, interesting that the, the term salvation is so often used. Salvation from the catastrophe that's about to befall us. Um, this book, which is one of my favorite books, I've got a lot of favorite books, <laughs> I must say, um, is about the um, the rise and embarrassing, humiliating fall of uh, Sir Oswald Mosley in uh, the 1930s in Great Britain, the fascist leader. He never amounted to anything. In fact, he's considered by the British to be a bad joke. But I'm not really here to talk about fascism. And for the record, I'm not trying to smear antinatalists by bringing their philosophy uh, into um, the same mix as fascism. But one of the interesting articles, or one of the interesting aspects of this debate, or this study of fascism in Britain in the 1920s and 30s, is the attitudes that um, drew people towards it. One of the main ones was uh, civilization was under threat by um, swarms from the slums who were falling into this terrible ideology of Marxism, or uh, whatever else you might want to call it, some sort of idea that the poor, the swarms from the slums, were going to take over the world and um, bring us all down to their level. This underpinned a lot of the fear of communism, and in some ways the class hatreds that are illustrated in that kind of attitude have dropped off considerably recently. Um, even in, say, a country that's as class-ridden as, for example, Great Britain, um, the class hatreds of today are more or less, I would say, at least compared to the past, non-existent. People don't realize that um, it wasn't just snobbery that underpinned the class system in the past. It was class hatred. The classes feared and hated each other. And a lot of lower middle class and even upper class people were drawn towards fascism as a means of protecting the civilized people of this world against the swarms from the slums. Um, the reason for that is, of course, the old belief that um, as people become more refined and aristocratic, they turn into a uh, species of Oscar Wilde's, uh, i.e., all that they ever do is spend their times in their time in intellectual and um, uh, voluptuous pursuits, and don't have children, and uh, die off, leaving the world to the swarms from the slums. Um, and that, to me, uh, points to one of the flaws in the antinatalist argument: the assumption that. Um, people are going to stop breeding voluntarily. 
Again, this is a loser. It's not going to happen. I can, let's say, let's say I, I convert wholeheartedly to the antinatalist point of view. I, I can say, okay, I'm not having any more kids. <laughs> People are going to stop, can continue to have kids. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, the old song, Ain't We Got Fun, there's nothing surer under heaven than the rich get richer and the poor get children. Uh, that's actually, uh, it's a silly song, Ain't We Got Fun, but um, it's actually, in, in my experience or my reading of history, quite correct. It underpinned uh, a lot of what the philosophical antinatalists, or whatever you want to call them, antinatalist uh, uh, intellectuals, said in the days when this sort of thing was being formulated, guys like Malthus. Um, the idea, the, the, the saying was, people are just going to keep breeding, and the people that are uh, breeding the most are the ones who are least capable of sustaining themselves. Now, again, the only thing that I will say is, um, in terms of any correlation between fascism and antinatalism, which, again, I am not saying is an inevitable correlation here, is the idea that um, somehow the people who don't know any better are going to have to be made to be antinatalists. Somebody uh, mentioned in a, the comment section of my previous video that some sort of uh, legislation might be necessary. Okay, what sort of uh, legislation? Even in a draconian police state like China, um, you'll note that controlling the population is not an easy thing to do. Um, cutting the birth rate is not the way to prevent population pressure from um, from damaging the uh, uh, damaging the world or making life more miserable for the people who will come after us. Or at least it's not the most effective way to do it. The most effective way to do that is to make things better here for the living. Antinatalism, if you ask me, um, goes against that. And not only that, antinatalism of the catastrophic kind that it likes to use all the rhetoric of hellish suffering and overpopulation and pollution and all that sort of thing, actually, um, again, is not a healthy thing for the depressed individual and allows the depressed individual to be manipulated. Not that I'm saying that any manipulation is taking place here in this debate. Thank you.